Lots of stars in Oakland over the years, but who are the best of the best? Let's find out. You are Locked On A's, your daily Oakland A's podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Well, welcome back. It is time for another episode of Locked on A's. Of course, we're here every day giving you all you need to know about the Oakland A's. I'm Wayne Coy, lifetime A's fan and media dude for lots and lots of years. Uh, I now live in Las Vegas, but I'm originally from the East Bay, Oakland, uh, and then San Leandro after that, and then San Ramon and Dublin and on and on to the break of dawn. A's country. You know what I mean? Thank you for making Locked On A's your first listen every single day. We do appreciate that. Of course, it's your team every day, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. What a deal they've got for you. $50 bet gets you maybe $150 in bonus bets. It could happen. All you got to do to get the information is go to fanduel.com slash Locked on, and everything you need is right there. Well, let's dive in. We got news. Right-handed pitcher Devin Sweet. You heard me talking about him earlier in the season. I was saying uh, after we got him that I thought he showed a lot of promise. I thought that he'd been uh, maybe undervalued. And when the A's were able to sort of grab him and get him up to the major leagues, I thought, all right, we got something here. Oops, spoke too soon. Uh, The San Francisco Giants is now where Devin Sweet calls home. The 27-year-old right-handed pitcher will be making his living on the other side of the bay. Uh, Basically, what happened was the A's had to make room uh, after they got Trevor Gott last week, after they got Gott. Yeah. So when they had to do that, they tightened everything up, and that left a couple players hanging out. The Giants... Uh, you know, they, they were born, but it wasn't yesterday. They saw what was there. They grabbed him and used one of their three roster spots that they had available. So uh, they're still, I think, at like 38 and while the A's sit at 40. In other news, A's owner John Fisher plans to display selections from his family's collection of art. Where? At their new stadium, of course, in Las Vegas. According to the uh, Review Journal, this is what's up. Apparently, this collection was developed by Fisher's parents. That would be John, the late John. Did I say John? (laughs) I got John on the brain. Don Fisher, who is uh, John's dad, and Doris Fisher, his mom. Now, uh, Don has passed away, but Doris is still here. And they are co-founders of the collection, which has now been passed on to the kids. So the Doris and Donald Fisher Collection will be on display, at least some of it anyway, at the uh, new stadium in Las Vegas. It does include more than 1,100 different works, including uh, some pretty cool, iconic things like Andy Warhol's Elvis collection, you might remember, from 1963. One of those, Triple Elvis, sold for a bunch of money, like $81 million back in 2014. I'm not quite sure which one the Fishers have, but... Apparently, we'll all be able to see it at the new stadium. So art meets baseball at the corner of Tropicana and Las Vegas Boulevard. All right, let's talk about the the ranking that I sort of teased you with, which is the the best of the best. It's been 55 plus years that the A's have been in Oakland. Lots of great players have played there over the years. But what if you had to narrow it down to like the best three at every position? Ooh, let the debates rage. Because certainly, I'm going to give you my opinion, and you may not agree. That's what the comment section is for. So let me know what you think. We'll take these position by position. We're going to start off with the tools of ignorance, the catcher behind home plate. Number three, I'm picking Sean Murphy. And you may say, I can almost hear you now. Well, he didn't play there long enough to be considered best of the best. But what I I want to do is with any of these players who were basically given away in the white elephant sale, how appropriate, uh, you know, when cleaning house, trying to get rid of payroll, that's not really fair to the player or to the A's fan because you think about it, most teams that had a player like Sean Murphy would have kept him for a lot longer 
than the uh, four years that he played there, right? Debuted in 2019. He was only 24. So I like to project and go, okay, well, what did he do after the trade? Well, he picked up right where he left off. In fact, starting catcher for the National League in the All-Star game, of course, playing for the Braves, who make the, the uh, postseason this year. Interesting, too, is that they're kind of platooning him there, and I think that kept him even fresher than he always is. But pretty durable, 119 games in uh, 2021, 17 long balls, drove in 59, and then played 148 games in 2022, hit 18 homers, had 66 RBI, and uh, just an all-around catcher, too. In fact, he's known almost as much for his defense as he is for his offense. Heck of a player, Sean Murphy. I would have loved to have seen him play in Oakland for a long, long time. But you know how it is. At number two, how about a guy who played 10 years at catcher for the A's? Ramon Hernandez averaging 139 games a season. Now, did I say 10 years? I meant five. <laughs> it's going to be one of those days. Yeah, five years for Ramon, not 10. But 139 games a season. That's, that's Iron Man there for a catcher. I mean, that's, that is a lot of work. And, of course, as steady as they come, again, defensive stalwart. Uh, and remember this, if you would, when you're thinking of Ramon and his defense, part of a catcher's job, in fact, a very important part of it, is, of course, managing a pitching staff. Well, don't forget, he was the catcher for the big three, Hudson, Mulder, Zito, who had so much success as a trio. And behind the plate for all of them, Yep, that would be Ramon Hernandez, who is uh, back with the A's now as an interpreter. Of course, his most memorable moment as an athletic came in game one of the 2003 ALDS against the Boston Red Sox. Bases loaded, two outs, bottom of the 12th. You're thinking, can we get it? We did. Hernandez, nobody expecting a bunt. And he laid down a perfect one down the third base line, scored Eric Chavez, and that won the game. Just noticed that I said, I did, didn't I? I said translator. Sorry about that. Actually, translator slash coach. That would be Ramon Hernandez's position. Kind of all over the place. All right. Number one, did I, did I leave enough mystery here? If I've got Ramon at number two, Sean Murphy at three, maybe you're thinking Gene Tennis. Maybe you're thinking... Mm, who else could you be thinking? Dave Duncan. Maybe you're thinking Manny Sanghia. Okay, I'll stop. Terry Steinbach, come on. You want to talk about somebody who's been around and uh, earned his place in the A's echelon of greats. Terry Steinbach, the catcher in 88, 89, and 90 when the A's went to the World Series. He played 11 of his 14 big league seasons in Oakland. And, of course, was a three-time All-Star, won the 1988 All-Star Game MVP Award, which I think gets you a new car. It's a new car. Also caught two no-hitters, which tells you something about how he is behind the plate. So, yeah, Terry Steinbach's going to be my number one to recap. Ramon Hernandez at two and Sean Murphy at number three. We're going to move on and talk about the first basemen that have played for the Oakland A's. But before we get there, let's talk about football. You know, some of our first basemen were also football players. One in particular, you might remember, big guy wore number 25. Yeah, he was a football player. I bet he loves FanDuel. Mark McGuire, do you? I bet you do. Are you ready for some football? Here we go. Playoffs are coming up in a few weeks. Still time for you to download that app. It takes no time at all. Once you get it, take advantage of the deal. And what a deal it is. Remember, a $5 bet on the money line, if you win and you're a brand new customer, can get you $150 in bonus bets. All right? That's waiting for you right now. Spreads, player props, overs, unders, whatever you want to bet, it's there for you with FanDuel. Get it at FanDuel.com slash locked on and get ready to jump on into the NFL season with FanDuel. They are an official partner of the National Football League. Well, we are ranking them today. In 55 plus years, the Oakland A's have had so many great players at every position. Narrowing it down to three is really hard, but we're going to do that here. So let's go. Number three, 
Matt Olson at first base, six seasons in Oakland, debuted in 2016, helped lead the A's to the playoffs in 2018, 2019, and 2020. His best year, of course, was his last year in Oakland, 39 homers, 111 RBIs, hit 271 in 156 games. And then, as we said with Sean Murphy, you take a guy who, if we were any other team, there's no way we're letting Matt Olson go, at least certainly not for what we got in return, uh, but that's not the A's way. So taking that into consideration, what did Matt do in the next year? Well, he continued to absolutely mash, leading the National League in slugging percentage at 604, had 54 home runs, first in the NL, and same thing with RBIs, tops in the league with 139, and played a great defensive first base. That's what I'm talking about. That should have happened in Oakland. Getting to the point where you're bringing the kid up through the minors, he finally makes his debut, does what he did, which is play great, get to the playoffs. We didn't get to reap the benefits of the, the prime of his career, which is just a, a shame, really. And number two, I, did you think I was going to say Gene Tennis? I almost thought that's what you thought I was going to say. But no, I'm going to say Jason Giambi. Yeah. Only an MVP, right? 2000, what a year that was. He hit 43 home runs in 2000, had uh, a 333 batting average and 137 RBIs. Those are MVP numbers. And just in case you think it was a fluke, he came back the next year, finished second in the MVP vote, 342 batting average, 38 bombs, drove in 120. And of course, the A's made it to the ALDS both of those years. Giambi at first base took basically right where Mark McGuire left off. He picked up an impressive debut, an impact immediately, and of course, a member of the Oakland A's Hall of Fame. Signed with the Yankees as an unrestricted free agent back in uh, 2002. We had to boo him, of course, a little bit, just let him know how we felt. But listen, if we don't do that, then we probably don't get Scott Hatterberg, and maybe we don't get the streak, and we don't get Moneyball, all of that. So maybe at the end of the day, it was a good thing that we had to replace Jason Giambi with, what, four different players? <laughs> yeah. It's Moneyball, baby. Okay, number one, leave no doubt about it. I know you've already figured it out. So, yes, 16-year Major League career with the A's and the Cardinals. Mark McGuire hits 583 home runs of those 363 of them were with the A's, 10th most in baseball history. In 1987, he hit 49 home runs as a rookie. In fact, at the All-Star break, a lot of people were like thinking, hey, this guy is going to, as a rookie, beat the Roger Maris record for home runs in a season. Well, part of that was right. You had the right guy to get the record. It just wasn't in 1987. That, of course, happened in 1998 when McGuire, as a member of the Cardinals, broke Roger Maris's single-season record, uh, which he set back in 1961, of 61 home runs. And McGuire ends up at 70 for the year, which really you'd think, wow, that's going to be a record that'll stay forever. It was like three years. And then Barry Bonds, of course, eclipsed it by hitting 73 in 2001. Like Jason Giambi, McGuire is a member of the Oakland A's Hall of Fame, and he's my pick to play first base on our all-time team. Going to move on to second base, but before I do, a little program reminder. I don't know if you knew this or not, but this is kind of cool. We at Locked On are now giving you an opportunity to dig into sports 24 hours a day on a brand new network. It's called Locked On Sports Today, and you can get it 24-7, 365, streaming on YouTube. It's the world's first all-day, all-night streaming sports network. You get all the regional stories. You get, of course, everything that's happening locally from all the different reporters all across the country, which is very, very cool. And of course, the national channels as well. So make sure that you check it out again. It's Locked On Sports Today, and you can find it on YouTube. When we finish with this uh, episode here today, I'm just going to send you over there, make it easy for you. Okay, that's coming up. But let's move over to second base now. We got our catcher, got our first baseman. What about second base? Well, at number three, I'm going to take another guy who was in the World Series quite a bit, and that would be Tony Phillips. 
Yeah, Tony Phillips, March 17, 1981, the A's get him from the Padres in a really cool deal where they sent uh, from the Padres Kevin Bell and Eric Mustad to the A's for Spacey Bob Lacey and pitcher Roy Moretti. Who? Exactly. Phillips becomes the first member of the Oakland A's to hit for the cycle. Can you believe that? Took all the way until until he got there to do that. Like it was, I think, 14 years or something like that. Well, actually, a little more than that. 1986, May 16th against the Orioles. In fact, Tony Phillips five for five and hits for the cycle. In 1989, of course, he got his batting average up to 262, which was kind of a high mark for him as a hitter. The A's sweep the Giants. Uh, to win that World Series in 1989. Phillips makes, of course, the last out of the 1989 World Series, which means he lives on forever in the highlights because that's how the game ended. Ground ball to Phillips, over to Dennis Eckersley covering at first base, and uh, that was all she wrote. Got Brett Butler out, and uh, the A's win their World Series there. They win the middle one of those three in a row. Would have been nice to have at least won one more, but just didn't work out that way. He was a defender to the end, finished his career in 1998 with a 968 fielding percentage. Really good. And very sad because Tony Phillips left us way too early. He died in Arizona of a heart attack in 2016, and he was only 56 years young. We miss him. He's at number three. Number two and our all-time second baseman in Oakland came down really to two guys that share a lot in common besides the position, and we'll tell you what that is. But at number two, Dick Green, member of the 1972, three, and four World Series championship teams, and actually came to the A's all the way from Kansas City. Uh, he started there, moved to Oakland with the team, won the Babe Ruth Award in 1974 for the World Series. Here's the deal. Had he gotten like one or two hits, he probably would have been the MVP of the 74 series. I mean, Dick Green put on a clinic defensively. The guy was everywhere. In fact, he turned six double plays, which at that time was a record for a five-game series. A's beat the Dodgers. Dick Green just flashing that glove everywhere. But again, it was, a, it was an issue at the plate. So he doesn't win the award. Raleigh Fingers does. Uh, Dick Green goes away with the Babe Ruth Award. Not bad. Uh, but, yeah, he was 0 for 13 at the plate. And that's what cost him the MVP award. But besides that 74 season, there were many before it. Dick Green certainly uh, was one of those guys whose name you could pretty much write in to the lineup card every single day for the A's uh, from 68 all the way until he retired. Before the 1975 season, decided to leave baseball. He'd actually almost retired or had announced his retirement another time or two before that, but this time it was for real. So Dick Green hung him up, went all the way back to South Dakota, where he and his family ran a moving business. And that worked out very well for him. Uh, no doubt about it, though, when it came to Dick Green, it was his glove that kept him around for so long. 12-year career, all of that for the A's, and he is probably one of the best defensive second basemen to ever play the game. In 2018, he was named to the Oakland A's 50th anniversary all-time team. And he has the number two spot for me when it comes to the best of the best. At number one, a guy who made his major league debut on April 9th, 2002. And for that season, he batted 272 in 98 games, hit 248 the following year, but he missed the entire 2004 season because he tore a labrum in his right shoulder. You may notice after that, it kind of became a recurring theme for Mark Ellis. Had a hard time staying healthy. Now, he did come back and lead the A's in batting average that year. Hit 316, led them in on base percentage at 384, and slugging average at 477 as the regular second baseman for the A's. In 2006, he broke Brett Boone's single season American League record for a second baseman with a 99685 fielding percentage. Wow. Ellis missing most of the 2006 postseason because he had a hand injury. That was not it. After that, he missed the last two months of the 2008 season because of cartilage damage in his shoulder. Along the way, though, he did tie the A's record for consecutive errorless games by a second baseman. And I'll let you figure out whose record that was. <laughs> yeah.
okay? And he underwent successful surgery that fixed his torn labrum from that previous injury. So in October of 2008, thinking that they pretty much had him healthy, the A's signed him to an $11 million contract through 2010 with an option of extending that deal by another season. Well, here's an amazing stat for you. Mark Ellis, born and raised in Rapid City, South Dakota, which also happens to be the city that that other guy that we just talked about, Dick Green, also has called home during and after his playing career. How nuts is that? Rapid City is not a big place. It's a little speck on the map, but here you got the two best second basemen, as far as I'm concerned, to play for the A's. Sorry, Zach Geloff, you got a ways to go. Uh, up to this point, both from Rapid City, wow, South Dakota, salute. We've got the A's quiz, and of course, this date in A's 3, we'll get to both of those things for you. How about uh, we start with A's 3 and things that happened? Well, 1973, Dick Williams, the manager of the A's, had had enough of Charlie Finley and decided that he was leaving and announced to the team during the series that that would be it. As soon as the series was over, he was on his way to another job. He was accepting the New York Yankees job, working for George Steinbrenner uh, in New York. But he didn't realize that Charlie Finley wasn't gonna let that happen so easy. You see, Dick Williams was under a three-year contract and still had a year to go. So Finley put his foot down, went to the commissioner, cried foul, and the commissioner had Finley's back and voided the deal. So Dick Williams did not go to the Yankees. Instead, he sat around and waited to see how long it was gonna take for the ice to thaw and Charlie Finley to allow him to take another job. Well, he only had to wait until July of the next season, 1974, when he decided to go and sign with the California Angels. I don't know if it's because Finley had a thing with the Yankees and felt like, well, he's not going to hurt us as much with the Angels, or did he want him to go to the Angels because they were in the same division? Famously, on their first trip back to Oakland with Dick Williams as their manager, Charlie Finley put it large as life up on the scoreboard at the end of the game when the A's won. Good night, Dick. Indelible. Well, of course, after that, Dick Williams with even more success with the Padres, another World Series opportunity there. And of course, eventually, a Major League Baseball Hall of Fame manager. Dick Williams on this date in 1973. 75, Chuck Tanner, another A's manager, signs a three-year deal to manage the A's. Finley, of course, says, come on in here after Alvin Dark had taken him to the World Series in 74 uh, and 75 they decide to bring Chuck Tanner in for 1976. And when he gets there, he realizes these aren't the same A's that had just won the World Series in 72, three and four. Uh, Tanner never makes it to the second year of his deal. The A's don't finish first, they finish second, although not bad, 87 and 74, the one year that uh, Chuck Tanner was here. And the A's traded their manager to the Pittsburgh Pirates. I brought up his name earlier, Manny Sanguian. Got traded to the A's late in his career, along with $100,000. Charlie needed the money. And of course, Chuck Tanner became the manager of the Pirates. 1979, he didn't have to wait too long. We are family, the Pirates win the World Series. 2004, two days after trading pitcher Mark, or Mark, Tim Hudson, who had finished 17 and eight, by the way, to the Braves, the A's turn right around and deal Mark Mulder to the Cardinals. What'd they get back? Well, they got Dan Heron. They got reliever Kiko, Kiko Calero. They got uh, minor league, I even, don't even wanna bring this guy's name up, but I have to. Minor league catching prospect, eventually played first base to Derek Barton. I know. Five of the six players actually obtained by giving up two thirds of the team's big three were expected to be part of opening day in Oakland, and almost all of them were on this day in A Street. Happy birthday to Ty Cobb. And before you say, wait, he played for the Tigers, not the A's. Hold on. Ty Cobb had a long career, played 15 years for the Tigers, and then after that, another six as not just a player for the Tigers, but a player manager. And then, well, then he got offered a lot of money by Connie Mack, owner and manager of the A's to come play in Philadelphia. 
Ty Cobb was born, but it wasn't yesterday, saw the money that was there and joined his new team, the A's. So there you go. And actually did very well. 1927, he had 357. And in 1928, at the age of 41, Ty Cobb hit 323. After those two seasons, he retired back to Georgia and uh, lived all the way to 1961 and the age of 74. But it's his birthday today, December 18th. We celebrate Ty Cobb's birthday. Even for only two years, he was an athletic. And former Oakland A's outfielder Steve Hovley, who? Yeah, Steve Hovley, uh, was drafted twice, which is pretty cool. First by the Angels in the uh, 35th round of the 1966 MLB Amateur Draft, and then by the Seattle Pilots, who were an expansion team in 1969. So Hovley got the, the luxury of being drafted not once but twice, graduated from Stanford, Palo Alto, and eventually made his way to the A's in 1970, played there in 70 and 71 in Oakland, total of 96 games for the A's. He was a big leaguer for only five years, two of those, of course, in Oakland, but he saw his career get cut short by injury at the age of 28 as a member of the Kansas City Royals in 1973. Steve Hovley is 79 years young today. Happy birthday, Steve. And I want to thank you for being the card that I seem to be able to get almost every pack. Here I am looking for Reggie and Catfish and Sal and Vida, and here comes Steve Hovley. <laughs> you know how that works, right? If you're collecting baseball cards and you're chasing the big name, you, you'll get that one guy all the time. And for me, 1971 tops, Steve Hovley. I can see that card in my sleep. All right, it's time for today's A's quiz. And speaking of our birthday boy, Mr. Hovley, five other members of the 1969 expansion Seattle Pilots found themselves playing in Oakland at the Coliseum for the A's the very next year. Of those six, five were position players and only one was a pitcher. Okay, position players were first baseman Don Mincher, Outfielder Tommy Davis. Second baseman, no relation, John Donaldson. Catcher Larry Haney, that's another card I used to get a lot. And Hovley. So there's your five position players. There was only one pitcher. Who was the only pitcher to have been a member of the Pilots for the one and only year they played in Seattle before they became the Milwaukee Brewers and then came to Oakland in 1970? And he didn't just pitch for the A's, he won 10 games. And he led the American League in ERA with a 2.56 earned run average. Wow. Who was that guy? If you know, put his name down in the comments and let's see if you're right. Love to see if you get it and I'm counting on you. And I also wanna tell you that I appreciate you for being here every day as we keep you up to date with everything that's going on with the athletics. Thanks for putting up with my uh, voice issues today. A little thin, I know, but we got through it. So I appreciate that. Give us the old thumbs up if you can, help us spread the channel. And of course, subscribe. And when you do that, you know, you won't miss an episode. You'll know every time that we're here. And we certainly do want you to be. Hopefully we will see you right here. Locked on A's, your team every day. I'm Wayne Coy, and until the next time, you keep on swinging.